Today, we are honored to have Scott Phillips, the founder and CEO at About It Ventures. Scott has a background in law, and he's also an entrepreneur who has a strong interest in innovation and technology. Scott will share his expertise in the industry and the current trend in technology today. So please put your hands together virtually. <laughs> Welcome, Scott. Well, thanks, Katie. Uh, yes, hi everybody. Um, my name's Scott. Um, I'm, I'm the CEO of Vault Adventures. And today we're going to get into a little presentation about, we're going to zoom out a bit here on the broad view of technology and humanity and law and cryptography. So there's just a whole lot of stuff in this. And really what I think this is about it in the most important way, perhaps, is what I call the quantum apocalypse. So quantum computing is not over, right? Quantum computing has barely begun. And what we're really seeing at the moment is something very powerful happening where AI and quantum computing are both happening at the same time. So AI is the, is the brain of this equation and quantum computing is the muscle. So this is really going to change everything. Now, let me just insert a little piece in here about what quantum computing actually is. Traditional computing we all know is zeros and ones. So inside an analog device, which we call digital, right? There are voltages going through gates and bits of circuitry and everything. And they are thresholded. And if they are, the voltage is thresholded at a high enough point, it's a one. And if it isn't, it's a zero. And so that's traditional computing. You, you add zeros and ones together, you get numbers. You add numbers together, you get pixels and all sorts of other things. Now, quantum computers don't work like this. They use quantum bits instead of normal bits, ones and zeros. And a quantum bit has a quantum state, is neither a zero nor a one. It has a probability of being one or the other. And what a quantum computer does using quantum physics is it collapses that to find an answer. Now, if you have a quantum computer with lots of these, you can solve actual problems but you don't have to go grinding through all the possibilities to solve it. You set it up, you collapse it down to the answer. It's kind of magical, but more importantly, it's super powerful. And prepare to have your minds blown over the next decade or so, because this is just going to accelerate super rapidly. So, you know, with quantum computing my message really is winter is coming right the quantum night king is coming to destroy traditional public private key cryptography because in this way collapsing the qubits to, to to find the answers to these problems means that you can feed it a public key and get it to calculate the private key so if you've got an exposed public key, then our oh, Mr. Night King here is going to come along probably within the next decade and just turn your security framework into digital confetti. Right? It's just going to shred it. So this is a problem that nobody's talking about, hardly. And then along comes AI. AI is a trickster. It, it has, it's non-human, has no concept of what is true or what can cause harm. And then on top of this, we've got the evolution of and the emergence of the metaverse. So the metaverse, I mean, you think that TikTok is addictive, right? Well, you wait until we're all stepping through some 
3D virtual reality or augmented reality version of this, we don't really know quite where this goes. My graphics, here we go. So we don't quite know where the, how deep the rabbit hole goes here. And at the moment, we don't really have a map or a way to separate fact from fiction. And it's pretty clear that we need some sort of framework for regulating this industry, like collectively, metaverse, AI, quantum, all together. To, to just let this roll without some real guiding frameworks is a recipe for disaster. Right, so, so we see really these three massive global challenges. The quantum apocalypse on public key infrastructure, the need for regulating AI, and this transition that I see as at least being possible to a world of commerce based on privacy. The question overall really is how do we tame the monster that, that we've created and are in the process of creating further. So now let me introduce you to what my group is doing. So Vault Adventures, the logo on the left, is the company. Um, Vaulted Objects, the logo on the right, is the, the framework and this new data type that the framework supports. So this is really made of four key components. Vaulted Objects, to begin with, is what I regard as one leg of the stool. Sometimes when I talk about this, this diagrams up, so, up the other way in my head and it's sort of a, a three-legged stool. The first leg of the stool is a vaulted object. Now a vaulted object is a digital container and that allows you to bind digital content to the individual. The payments, pretty straightforward. We've seen this a lot in the blockchain world. And digital seals. You can think of this as digital signatures, but digital seals are slightly different and rather more potent. And then down the bottom here, we have the identity framework as well. So these different features can be combined in different ways. So here we're looking at the identity system combined with vaulted objects and digital seals. The, the digital seals are really about digital deeds and digital contracts. So this is bringing attestation into the digital world or the construction of digital contracts and deeds. And by combining those with the, the vaulted objects, you can do a, a few interesting things. You can do content provenance. This might be a journalist writes an article about some interesting or maybe controversial topic and they vault that. They put that inside a vaulted object and so it, it binds to their identity but with the digital seals on top of that, other people can come in and say, oh yeah, I've read that and, and I'm an expert in the field and I'm going to sign that. I'm gonna, sorry, I'm going to seal that with my digital seal to help to prove the veracity of the contents inside the thing. A uh, similar thing with certifications. That's kind of what universities do. A university degree, some people are surprised to find out, is a deed. It's a, it's a certificate of a kind as well, because a certificate is a deed. A warranty is a deed. There's a whole bunch of things in this world that are deeds that people don't really think of as, as deeds. Another thing is estate planning. Maybe you've got a digital asset that you want someone to have when you pass. You can create a will as a digital legal instrument and enable that then to be, to be passed along. So if you combine payments with digital seals, then you get a whole different set of implications. You've got commercial deeds. Right, so you can have, let's say it's a, a deed of non-litigation and, but you want the other person to pay for that, right? Because you know, there's a bit of a dispute or something, then you can set that up so that they can just pay and then they get 
the deed that you set up that says that's settled, you're not going to sue them. You can do IP licensing in a similar sort of way. Oh, you pay for the deed, bang, you get a license. It's just a standard offer, ready to go. And uh, in fact, coded contracts of any kind can be set up with this framework. And, and here we're combining payments and vaulted objects together. With this, you can do content marketing. Okay, the vaulted object, maybe that's an EP. Maybe that's your new avatar. And bang, paid, boom, you get it. This is not at all dissimilar from digital assets, a la the whole NFT game. In fact, vaulted objects were, were designed and built in response to that whole thing. NFTs are problematic, to say the least, because for something that purports to give you secure ownership of a thing, they actually do neither. A, a JPEG of a, you know, classically a monkey picture or whatever, all those pictures, you can't put images on blockchains in the main, right? You certainly can't put them on Bitcoin. You can't put them on Ethereum. Those things are sitting on web servers. The tokens, little ledger entry, yeah, that's on a blockchain, but then it links with the URL to a web server. If you know anything about how the web works, you'll know that anything that's sitting on a web server, any link can 404 in a heartbeat, somebody moves that from that web server, it's a 404 error, file not found. If you Google NFT 404, you'll find a litany of horror stories where people have paid a lot of money for the pictures of monkeys or whatever, and they've broken. So that's problematic. And, and there's really no explanation as to how you get enforceable legal ownership over an NFT. Whereas with a vaulted object, these have been set up such that you quite clearly possess the digital content as the owner. You're the only one that can extract that content from the encrypted vault. And if you can possess a thing, then you have what at law is called a shoes in possession. Now, shoes is a French word, means thing. So you have a thing in possession, or oh, the ownership of a thing because you possess it. And if anyone can explain to me how you get legal rights over an NFT, I'd love to hear it. Access authentication is another thing you can do. Maybe it's an Airbnb or something like that. Um, so now let's talk about the identity protocol because this explains really why this framework is so secure. The identity protocol, it uses public key infrastructure, but it does not expose the private key or the public key. So the public key or the key pair itself is maintained within what's called a soft CSP. That's a, a cryptographic service provider for the uninitiated. And that's hosted within Azure in a virtual machine. So we can see here that the self-sovereign secure identity protocol piece has that functionality from Azure uh, built into it. Now, everyone's probably here familiar with a CSP, not by name perhaps, but every time you log on to your computer with a password, you're interacting with the cryptographic service provider and that cryptographic service provider has privileged access to the file system on your computer, right? So it's not going into the operating system. It's just going straight to the disk and it's hiding some cryptographic secrets away there. The same thing happens in the cloud in a soft CSP. So by protecting the keys in this way, what we do is we, we remove the problem from the view of the night king of quantum apocalypse, right? So it makes it quantum resistant by removing it as an attack vector. Like how do you use this? Your keys are in the cloud. You need something else, right? So we need to actually bind the mobile device to the soft CSP and the identity framework in the cloud. And this is done using something that's very similar to what you might've used with Google Authenticator. A Google Authenticator uses a, a TOTP, time-based one-time password. And we're using something really similar. It's a hash-based one-time password. So the only difference is that it changes every time you use it rather than once every minute. 
So that's the way that we establish the binding with a, with a shared secret on the device and, and in the cloud. And then this HOTP stuff keeps that binding alive. Now, what this means is that if you then unfortunately drop your phone down a stormwater drain or something like that, then you don't lose your keys because the keys are in the cloud. You lose the binding because of the, you lost the device, but then you can get a new device. There's a process set up with your friends and family, your doctor, your accountant, and you can say to all of them, hey, I need to recreate my identity. The system needs to know that I'm who I say I am, and you know that. So if you just hit this button, boom, I'm, I'm back. So there has to be that social dimension to this because we as the platform operator can't have and don't want the power to just go, oh yeah, we'll fix that. Boom. Right? No. So here we are back to the main view, right? So in, in all this, users get free, oh, sorry, password free access to all the applications. So with this OTP stuff, all your, all your password nonsense goes away. You've just got something that's bound to your device to authenticate your identity. So users can't lose their keys and they now have a secure digital identity that they control. Right, so, so now we'll get into what a vaulted object is a little bit more. So a vaulted object is an encrypted data container that binds to the creator's digital identity. That's essentially what a vaulted object is. It's actually under the hood, it's a JSON implementation of CMS. Now CMS is a, very long-standing standard. It's the cryptographic message syntax. And, and that itself is based on S-MIME, which is what you make email out of. So this is all based on very garden variety web technologies, just reconfigured in a slightly different way. A vaulted object is, is effectively JSON. So it's metadata all the way down. It's nodes of this and that. One of the nodes is the encrypted content. One of the nodes is the chain of title. And every time a vaulted object is transferred from one user to another, then the new user goes into that chain of title. So you can see who the creator was because they're always the first one in the chain. And then you can see who the current owner is because they're always the last one in the chain. So what this does anyway is it creates the ability for you to own a digital file. This is kind of digital property. And I think perhaps given what I know about NFTs, this is the first type of digital property. So yeah, there's sort of three elements to it. There's, there's the positive rights side of it. There's ownership. There's the, what are, sort of like the negative rights side of it, which is actually duties and, and the provenance of what that content is. And then there's a data privacy piece. But let me just unpack this provenance of content stuff a little bit, because this really relates to what we've spoken about in terms of AI and what Tony and I were kicking around earlier on about AI regulation. So basically what becomes possible with this is for you to say, all right, I'm an AI company, let's say, and I'm a bit worried that somebody might want to come and sue me for the stuff that my users have done with my platform and, and my AI because all these companies are going right out of their way to not allow their systems to generate defamatory content, abusive, bullying content, discriminatory content, whatever. So there's a problem there. But instead of the companies bearing the world on their shoulders for that duty of care, what this enables is for them to say, no, if you're going to use this system, we are a licensed provider of AI content and we'll issue you the content, sure, no problem, as a vaulted object. Once you've KYC, once you have a digital identity, once somebody, not everybody, somebody knows who you are, right? Because if you do something defamatory that, or in other, other ways causes harm, then you're on the hook for that, not us right and not our insurers this is what i mean by provenance right? you can really tie things down and join the dots as to who needs to exercise their duty of care now because the content inside a vaulted object is also encrypted it's also private right so 
this can be a really useful mechanism for data privacy. You can do things like trade secrets. Bang. Hmm. Want to pay to get access to trade secret? Yeah, we can do that. And there's a whole intellectual property management story in here. But we, we've also got, and I've got a link on the on the back of this presentation on a, an article that I've written titled "Privacy Capitalism," because what this data privacy piece can do is it can enable you to put little tiny bits of data into a vaulted object and just whisper your little secrets in there of what you want, right? What you need to like. Let's say, let's say I'm going to a concert tomorrow afternoon in the city. I need to get in there somehow. I'm not going to drive my cars, no parking. It's going to be a scooter, an Uber, a Lyft or a bus, right? So my AI agent knows that I need this and, and it goes out and it says to Uber and Lyft and the scooter company and the bus company, it says, got a client for you, needs a transport option. What have you got tomorrow afternoon? And you have to pay for that. You have to pay this person for their data. And Uber and Lyft and everyone go, oh, fantastic. Oh, what, 50 cents? Really? Oh, it cost me, you know, three bucks on Google. So yeah, sure, bang, right? Now they've got a really hot opportunity to provide a good deal to that user and get a conversion straight away. Not have them to go shotgun in the dark trying to advertise to them. So that's a whole nother piece. Uh, the payments side of the infrastructure. So the... Infrastructure has access to a very sophisticated state-of-the-art payments rail. Payments can be made in any national currency. They settle atomically within around 100 milliseconds with full finality. There are no fees on transactions or on the foreign exchange on this framework. So this is a new thing. Now, what are the implications of super efficient payments? Well, obviously, Payments are designed to reduce economic friction. So the future economy can be much more efficient and they stimulate growth and they enable new businesses. Now, one of the things that the framework supports in particular is micropayments because there's no fees, right? Fees kill micropayments. And this is why blockchain has struggled a bit because it's baked into the cake that you have to provide incentives to miners to provide the security in the mining. And so that means that there's a cost on every transaction. And that means that there's a point below which it doesn't make any sense. You can't go out and do a, you know, a one thousandth of a cent transaction on Ethereum because it'll cost you, I don't know, what, 30 cents to do it or something, right? So it's just not economically feasible at that point. So being able to do that means that Oh, you can run a business model that does require people to make a hundredth of a cent payment. Now, seals and deeds. So quantum computing is set to destroy existing digital signature technologies within the next few years. All right, well, what does that mean? What that means is that the technology behind DocuSign, Adobe Sign, HelloSign, and the long tail of also ran on digital signatures, the certification authority digital certificates that are behind those, they have exposed public keys. Hmm. Remember the Night King? Quantum computing is going to come along and turn all this into confetti. And there's a whole lot of commercial contracts and deeds of mortgage guarantee and stuff like that <laughs> that are out there have been signed with these certification authority certificates behind the scenes that are going to blow up within the next 10 years for sure. So that's a problem. Now, our system of digital seals is designed to solve that. And that works because of the piece that I explained before about the public-private key pair being inside the soft CSP. Because those keys are not exposed, there's an identifier for that identity called a secure identity number that we use instead of the public key to address it. You don't want to address things with a public key. Right, so implications for digital seals. Seals have always been around to reduce fraud. 
and to increase trust. That's fundamentally what, what they're about. To provide that attestation, because what you really want to be able to do is you want to be able to bind the identity of the executor, the person doing the thing, to the text, the written text of the promise. And in days of old, the best technology to do this with was lambskin parchment, particularly lambskin. And why? Because when you prepare the lambskin parchment, you line it, you dissolve a layer of fat in the lambskin. And what that does is makes it so that you can write on it just the same with your, you know, with your cool pen, whatever. But if you went to scrape the ink off, it would delaminate and it would make a god awful mess of it. And then you would know that it's been tampered with. So it's a tamper proof technology. And then of course your, your, your wax seal and the impression from your, from your signet ring or your, or your stamp seal, that would provide the forensics into that seal that is then stuck to the letters of the promise. And that's what this system does as well. But instead of parchment, we use limited set ASCII text, something more simple than a PDF, more simple than wingdings in Word documents. Just give me the facts, ma'am, no funny characters. And the, the seal itself is actually a, a JWT, a JSON web token. And that's bringing key material in from the identity framework that provides the forensics to say, yep, yeah, this is me, bang. And then those together get hashed and the hash encrypted to stick that all together. So we go. Okay, so now let's talk applications because this is this is this layer on, on top of the stack here. Applications are able to combine functions in any way for any purpose, right? So we can stick vaulted objects together with seals and or payments in those combinations that we, we played with before. And of course, any of these can also work with the identity framework. Now we've done a bit of a dig into this and we've identified more than 50 business models that leverage the framework which probably means that they're infinite. We've still got our eyes and ears out for the most interesting and exciting ones. But really what we are then setting up to do is to go out and, and license access to the technology to other developers so they can build on top of the framework as well. We think that this is really a type of Web3 technology. This, this does not involve any kind of Nakamoto consensus blockchain. Blockchain is just a design pattern in the world, the wide world of cryptography. I define Web3 as the financialization of the internet at the protocol level. So this is definitely that. This is definitely internet protocol. And in that sense, it's quite fundamental in the sense that it's very fundamental informatic stuff that we're dealing with here. And it's also very fundamental legal concepts as well. Okay, so in terms of these applications, there's really a massive opportunity here to support the emerging metaverse economy. We saw things like Second Life back in the day with their Linden dollars and World of Warcraft with their WoW Gold. All of these multi-user virtual worlds have become interested in some way in doing payments or having assets. You know, people collect weapons and objects and things, and then they want to trade them with each other. So these companies have often been forced into building some sort of digital economy, normally just with a database, but then it's not transferring across domain. It's only happening at Second Life or it's only happening in World of Warcraft. The whole idea of digital economy applied to the metaverse is that bang, this is now across all domains and you can transport assets and, and the whole box and dice. These applications are not limited just to, well, certainly not just to the metaverse, not even to just the digital world, because this is now jumping out of the box and obviously digital payments are happening all over the place as we speak. There's also here a massive opportunity to provide a simplified user experience because we're doing away with logins. We're doing away with keys. We're doing away with passwords. 
we're not doing away with keys, sorry, but we're doing away with passwords. That just means that that all that friction that we're all really used to of like, oh God, what's my password? Or am I am I managing my passwords with a with a sensible password manager? By taking all that away, we have the opportunity to make really much better and much simpler things for people. When you think about it, it's incredible how insecure are using these transactions that's happening on the internet right now. And it's gonna get worse as we move into metaverse and all this virtual reality based transactions and so on. And mm -hmm. your innovations and technological sort of uh, strength with this strong legal background is really, really important for the future industry. 